Good evening and uh, welcome everyone. My name is Joe Guild. I'm a rancher living in Western Nevada and <clears throat> associated with ranching enterprises located in Nevada and California, the Eastern part of the state of Nevada and also the West. Also, I'm the current uh, treasurer of the National Cattlemen's Beef Association. It is my pleasure to welcome you to the fourth installment in this webinar series focused on soils, forage, and grazing. We are proud to be partnering on this series with experts from across the country who serve at places like the Noble Research Institute, King Ranch Institute, National, <clears throat> National Resource Conservation Service, many fine land grant universities, and also many pro producers that have been recognized as outstanding stewards of land, forage, and cattle. As a participant, I Participant, I would remind you that your line will be muted, <clears throat> but feel free to type in questions in the question box on your screen during the webinar. And at the end of the presentations, we will get as many uh, of you <clears throat> whose questions you've, you've asked as time will allow. If you have trouble with your technology, or if you are joining us only for the, the audio, the webinar is being recorded and will be available for viewing in a few, few days at ncba.org. Just look for the producer tab on the website. The webinar tonight is entitled Managing Drought, Effective Mitigation Strategies. It features uh, Hugh Aljo, Scott Stone, and Frank Price, who will introduce themselves as they speak to you. Uh, I'm very interested in this personally, this topic, because some of you may know that I ranch in a, in a six inch to 10 inch rain zone on both sides of Nevada. So in our operations, we're always on drought alert, if you will. With that, I'd like to introduce Frank Price, who with his son Sims, operates a ranching enterprise in the Sterling City area of West Central Texas. He was selected as the national winner of the 2013 Environmental Stewardship Award. Frank, I'm going to hand the presentation off to you. Thank you all. Bryce, uh, <clears throat> good afternoon. I hope to give you an overview of what we've done to make our ranching operation sustainable and drought resistant. Uh, remember that I certainly do not believe that uh, what we do is best for everyone. Everyone needs to build their own program that fits their operation, uh, and there's much room for improvement within our operation. Now, looking at this picture on the right, uh, there's some big blue stem that uh, appeared on some of our range land. It was not seeded. Um, I had no concept that we'd ever had big blue stem in this area, but when we, when we went into a more intensive grazing program, uh, it just uh, came to life and appeared, and I have determined from the cattle the way they graze it, it is extremely palatable. They'll graze it in the states you see it now, plumb to the ground while they're standing there, provided that that's the only uh, colony of that grass that's, that's in that pasture. And it gives you the perspective of what happens to those highly palatable grasses under continuous grazing. Every time it sticks its head up, they're going to graze it to the ground. Um, drought is a common occurrence in the area that we operate, and it seems that virtually everyone operating within the Great Plains or Western U.S. suffers from the same issues. Some areas are more susceptible than others, but all rangeland managers are continually facing this management issue of drought. 
since 1965. That's the year I became closely involved with ranching enterprise. I was a freshman in high school. I've witnessed no less than nine extended dry spells. Well, when you divide that out, that comes out to a drought on average every 6.1 years. Um, this historical study of sharks uh, tends friends, uh, show how important it is to be continually cognizant of and being prepared for the next dry spell. Drought isn't an ever nagging event. It is a continual part of the range land management process. Um, here we have a chart showing our rainfall, uh, annual rainfall. It ranges from 32 inches to 5 inches, an average of 18 inches. You can look at this chart and everything below that red line, which is the trend line, is a drier than normal conditions. When you have two to three years below that trend line, you're in what we consider to be a drought condition. When looking at this chart, you can see pretty regular that that happens. Uh, we're very fortunate to ranch in this area. It's good cool season and warm season country. And you know, I believe we live in, I live in God's country. God country is a, where a man resides, provided he understands the land and the environment within which he's operating. All right, this chart, uh, I'm not big on charts, but this one is uh, amazing in itself. It starts off in uh, 1876, uh, 150 animal units to the section, which is uh, mind blowing to me. In the early 1920, my great grandfather's records so it was running 64 animal units to the section. In 1965, when I was a freshman in high school, my ag teacher told it was 32 animal units to the section. Then in 2013, NRCS did a start study in Sterling County, and they came up with 10. We're going the wrong direction, folks. It's just getting worse and worse. Now that little uptick on the right-hand side shows the uh, some improvement we've seen since we uh, initiated the more intensive grazing program. Um, some would say that understanding the common almost regularity of drought and the loss of grazing capacity of our rangelands can be correlated to prove that drought is the cause of that loss of grazing capacity. A longtime friend, mentor, and neighbor told me very early in my career with each succeeding dry spell or drought, we can never run as much livestock as we could prior to that dry spell. Now, the first weather-related event of my life that I remember, I was three or four years old playing outside. I looked up and in the Northwest, here came this huge rolling red cloud. Like a scared puppy, I ran for the house, and far, as far as I was concerned, before I got to the house, it was totally dark. Uh, that's that's uh, quite a childhood memory. That was in the 50s, in the 30s, the, the uh, dust storms, the hubbobs, if it's what you want to call them, were much worse. Uh, the picture you see here was in June of last year, but so they're still occurring. Studies of tree growth and sediment studies show that drought has been with the land for hundreds of years, probably thousands or tens of thousands of years. And yes, drought has <coughs> on grazing conditions. And as my neighbor said, those droughts permanently reduce the grazing capacity, in particular when you're in a continuous grazing program. My opinion that we as rangeland managers have failed to recognize the cause of rangeland degradation as a result of continuing drought. That cause is the lack of giving the rangeland the opportunity to recover from not only the effects of drought, but the effects of grazing. The cure is proper grazing utilization of rest after grazing. Total rest is not the answer, as over the millennia, the Lord and his helper Mother Nature developed plants adapted to the graze rest process that the buffalo, elk, and other wildlife created. Understanding the relationship of drought and rangeland management are what we're going to discuss today. What can we do to prepare for a dry spell? 
first and foremost, use a planned grazing program that produces a healthy, deep-rooted, continuous, solid turf of perennial grasses and farms both cool season and warm season. This puts the ranchman in the position of getting away from a continuous grazing program and utilizing a planned rotational program grazing. That is the whole <coughs> That is the hardest management change for most producers, but it is by far the key and most important change a manager can make to establish long-term profitability and drought resistance. It's possibly the largest determining factor to that profitability. When it comes to a half inch of rain on sparsely vegetated, unhealthy soils, bare ground, home, most of the time that variable marsh Valuable moisture is quickly lost to wind and sunlight evaporation that runs downstream to the neighbor's rangeland, effectively producing no rangeland recovery. Conversely, that limited rainfall on healthy rangeland that is shaded by dense perennial plants and the litter that is always present with healthy soils can be a, an effective rainfall even after an extended drought spell. I, I, Observed this last early fall. We've had no rain through the summer months. Came a half inch of rain. Four days after that rain, go down into those areas that had that dense cover of grass. There was still moisture there in the soil. Really exciting to see that happen. Now then, utilizing this approach has produced recovering rains that is much more drought resistant. <coughs> continuous grazed land. We have run from drought, sending livestock to other areas, utilizing heavy feeding, or cut numbers drastically. However, recent dry spells with rangeland recovery due to the intensive graze rest program, we've been able to limit reductions in numbers and certainly have not had to utilize the very expensive option of moving livestock to rangeland that has received better rainfall. Now you look at this picture over on the uh, deep-rooted, healthy plants are much more drought tolerant. The green growing plants, they're probably not growing, but they're green. If you see your big blue stem, Indian grass, little blue stem, and look at the brown other perennial grasses, mid-sized grasses or, or short grasses that are browned out due to the dry weather. Those deep-rooted plants still have that green. That is exciting to see. Now then, warm season and cool season, we hear about uh, season-long deferment or deferment during the growing season. My first question is what grow growing season are we talking about? We're very fortunate in the area that I ranch, my son and I, to have warm season and cool season growth. Over on the left, you've got Cytoscroma, Texas cup grass, Really dense coverage, none of the tall grasses, but it's really good, excellent condition. Over on the right, we've got uh, Engelman daisy, which is a perennial farm, very palatable, a large root system. And uh, Canada wild rye, I'm beginning to think Canada wild rye with our rest, graze rest program may be the most valuable cool season grass we have. Our grazing program is built around a single herd, long rest, 250 to 300 days regimen, utilizing traditional already in place pastures. No, no wagon wheels, just take the pastures that are on the place when we take it on and, and make them work in our grazing program. More pastures can be added, added at a later time, and finances dictate going full bore, in my opinion, moving to a multi paddock, high intensity, low frequency mob grazing program, and some producers are extremely successful at that, but I don't believe that the, the new grazer that's interested in moving to a single herd program, he'd better stay away from that until he has the experience to uh, deal with the, the issues that, that it can create. The main thing is get started in some sort of rest program. Initiating a simpler, effective program then you can expand as you become more comfortable in the process. Duration of time spent in the grazing pasture depends on the number of pastures, 
size of the pasture and condition of each individual pasture. But of great importance, upon moving out of a pasture, and everything's being rested, but that one pasture we moved out of, we ask ourselves a question. If it does not come appreciable rain and growth of our grass before our next time grazing of that pasture, are there enough quality grazable plants to graze that pasture again? Very important question. If the answer is no, caution flag goes up. When we move from the next grazed pasture, if the same answer is no, time to move into our drought management plan. It'll be a long time before we come back, but we need to start taking the possibility of drought very seriously. We've never been able to use rainfall as a consistent indicator of an approaching drought. Drought, yeah, you get the feel, but observing those pastures is the most important thing I feel that we can do. Um, after initiating the grazing program we've chosen, which is that single third program, each preceding year, the rangeland is shown to be more resilient to dry spells. In other words, the better it gets, the faster it gets better. And that's uh, since we went to that long rest period, we were seeing that every year it's getting better. We're finding those smaller rain amounts are more effective than in the past, and that those deeper rooted grasses, including Indian grass, big blue switchgrass, are among the last to brown out, as that prior picture showed us. Now then, how is the, uh, the drought management plan structured? Hopefully we, the plan will be initiated well enough in advance that we'll, we will not be in a panic mode. That's one reason for the observation of the pastures that we do. A slow progression is important. Thus it comes, if it does come appreciable effective rainfall, the plan can be reversed without jeopardizing the factory, and the factory is the cow. You sell all the cows, in cow-calf operation, we're no longer in production. Each individual producer needs to develop his own plan as there are so many variables depending on the location, goals of the operation, labor availability, numerous other influences on each particular ranching operation. Listed below are some of the options that we utilize and some we prefer not to use. Once again, it's up to the individual which ones will work for him. Many options are available. Don't limit your operation to what I've listed here. First, early winging of calves. Second, reducing cow numbers. Open cows first, perhaps using sonograms to do your pregnancy testing at an earlier stage. Late bred cows come next, older cows next. So we're always trying to keep our younger cows as they will be the ones that are productive well into the next of the good times. We generally try to raise our own replacements as they are acclimated to our operation, both environmentally and socially. By socially, I mean they're adapted to how we handle them, moving from pasture to pasture. Uh, we can, you can bring in outside stock, but uh, our, our cattle are, are adapted to our program and I like staying with them. First producers, next, first, last, there's always room for improvement in the cow herd. During the expansion of the herd, which is generally the case since we implemented it in our single herd graze rest program, culling tends to be limited as we would rather own some of our own culls than buying someone else's culls. Limited supplementing, supplemental feeding can be productive for the short term, in particular of the approaching breeding season. Now we have built into our operation around never feeding mature calves, winter or warm season. Uh, this has been a very positive and consistently profitable for our operation. Heavy supplemental feeding is not an option for our operation, perhaps on a very short term basis until marketing can be initiated. However, if you have to go to this uh, heavy feeding, even for marketing, uh, it can be construed that uh, it was lack of early planning and waiting until the panic mode due to procrastination or poor planning. Moving livestock to a different area is a last resort uh, unless expansion of the operation is being considered. 
Uh, otherwise, it can be a very expensive process. Once again, these are thoughts for our operation. Each, each, each individual has to make their own determination. All in all, the first and last option of any producer that is wanting to create and maintain a consistently profitable operation, even in drought situations, should be a grazing management program that utilizes sustainable rangeland. My definition of sustainable rangeland, first I want to, the picture is in some very rocky, uh, it's not really steep, but uh, good, good elevation change. Um, here we have Indian grass, big blue, little blue, uh, white honeysuckle uh, that just appeared after we initiated that grazing program. Very important. Sustainable rangeland. Grasslands that when utilized for a specific goal or purpose, ranching in our case, are consistently improving and at a minimum showing equal health and vigor after timely recovery from that use. We have to give it that recovery time. Uh, thank you very much for uh, hearing me. And uh, Hugh, I'm going to turn it over to you. All right. Well, thank you, Frank. All right. Well, thank you very much, Frank, and I appreciate being a part of the uh, program today. I also appreciate Joe's uh, introduction and can really appreciate uh, the words of, of both these producers that are in part of the western part of the U.S. And most of uh, uh, what I've experienced here in the Southern Great Plains at Noble Research Institute as Director of Producer Relations and a Pasture and Range Consultant uh, is not quite as uh, arid, uh, not quite as risky of management as these two gentlemen face or the next gentleman um, uh, here in just a few minutes, Scott Stone. But what I will share with some of the some of the uh, highlights is we work with producers here in this part of the world in managing effective uh, 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 strategies toward managing the drought. You know, back in college, one of the wisest uh, sayings that I accumulated from Mr. Wayne Hamilton, who was one of, my, one of our range professors, is the time to start planning for a rain is while we're in a drought. And the time to start planning for a drought is, in, uh, is while it's raining. And we think about that, you know, the, the take home message is, is that we always need to be planning for the seasons ahead. And if we look at drought management, there's two time periods that we're always operating within. The period, the period during drought, as well as the period before the next drought. You know, we have always got to be thinking ahead and knowing that even in favorable, favorable conditions, there is a drought that's going to be looming ahead. If we just look at the long-term rainfall for so, uh, South Central Oklahoma, where Ardmore is located and you know, Noble Research Institute is located, uh, we can see that over 125 years, we've got a rainfall pattern that tends to show that we've got periods, excuse me, periods of favorable conditions as well as periods of unfavorable conditions. And we note that these tend to last for a period of time. One's followed by, followed by another. You know, the favorable conditions are going to be followed by unfavorable. Where are we at any given time? And as you move to the arid uh, western part of the United States, we see that these conditions may be even more extreme uh, uh, as we look at at these at these periods of time. But where do you begin to operate? How do we begin to stock? How do we manage our pastures if we're really trying to provide for drought resiliencies uh, in the long term? Because this lower area down here in the drought is real. And one of the things that we got to realize, similar to what Frank was talking about, is that after every drought, there's been an observed reduction in carrying capacity through, uh, you know, th through those periods following. And we've also go back and you note uh, the age of trees and some of the shrubs that have appeared in areas that historically were never part of the, uh, the natural floor, at least in these open spaces. And we'll see that they have all uh, appeared or begin growing sometime following one of these drought periods. So we have changed the flora through our grazing management, or in this case, the lack thereof during these drought periods. So what can we do in managing 
our own ranches in order to secure greater resiliency within these pastures so that when drought does come, we're more likely to uh, successfully uh, manage through it and mitigate the effects of the resource itself. So we want to really begin talking about drought uh, or managing drought, looking at what's the most effective mitigation strategy for drought. And really, it is preemptive management. Similar to what Frank was just talking about, some of the planning that he does and uh, the producers that we worked with that have been most successfully, what they do prior to the drought is lend, lend themselves to the opportunity to successfully navigate through these drought conditions. And they're usually fall into a couple of three areas that they're always prepared for. And the first, they proactively manage stocking rate and second pastures at any given time. There's always a plan in place. And in order to prepare for the drought, they're also developing contingency plans or drought plans as we would know them. So that's what we're going to talk about here briefly is just stocking rate management, pasture management, and contingency planning and show you what a prescribed drought plan might look like uh, for a producer, which as Frank pointed out, you have to adapt these things to your own operation and situation. But this will give you a template at least to step through and consider as you begin planning in the, into the future. So stocking rate management. Now, what we ideally would like to do is manage at or below, below carrying capacity. We understand this producer stocking rate is just the measure of forage demand. It's the number of animals that are out there at any given time. And carrying capacity is a measure of forage supply. That's the amount of forage that's been actually being produced. And it changes, and we know that it does. You as a manager have influence directly over stocking rate at any given time. Now, carrying capacity, that's a function of what? You know, primarily weather moisture conditions, and not to leave managers uh, unfocused on our previous management. How well we've managed in the past is going to influence the amount of carrying capacity going forward. So if we look at just that, that uh, long-term uh, hi history of annual precipitation, we can easily see that variable rainfall is going to equate to variable carrying capacity. And what we've really got to do as managers is always understand that we're trying to manage at a conservative, conservative stocking rate and adjust with this variability that we see. But in order to be able to adjust, we've got to manage somewhat below what we would consider normal or average type of precipitation. And we all know there's no such thing as, as average precipitation. But what type of safety net should we even be planning for so that gives us the resiliency necessary in order to be better managers of the land resources that uh, uh, we're accountable for. The next part of it we need to look at is just monitoring growing conditions. In order to, to manage that carry capacity or the stocking rate with the carrying capacity, we need to understand what the growing conditions look like. Where are you at at your property? One of the tools that uh, we like to recommend here at Noble is, is water your table. You know, typically in most part of the, uh, of the United States, when we get to our, about October, most of the growing season is complete. And with that being the case, most of the water recharge into the soil is going to begin sometime in the cool season months. As we move toward spring, as, as indicated by that uh, green box, we begin to want to build up a certain amount of precipitation or moisture within the soil. And if we relate it to precipitation itself, by the, we should expect somewhere, at least in this southern Great Plains, about a third of our annual rainfall to occur on a water year uh, by the 1st of April. If we don't have that at that point in time, spring may be slow to, uh, to get started. If we don't have about 45 to 50 percent of our annual water year precipitation by the 1st of May, uh, we may not have much of a spring and certainly by the end of, end of May, if we're not well on our way toward normal precipitation pattern or a favorable precipitation pattern, we will never acquire the potential of what we would consider an average carry capacity for, for our land resources. So what we've really got to be looking at is over here on the right side of the screen is that variance from the long-term average. We, we're, you know, where are you at any given time? Especially as we begin to enter the growing season and those early months in the growing season. Because with forages, there's rarely what I call compensatory gain. You know, there could be the unusual uh, uh, typhoon or hurricane that may saturate an area and we get a big boost, but typically what occurs early in the spring is what we've got to manage for 
through to the next growing season. So we've got to understand where we are. Is it just an indication? If your variance is, is, is a negative 10 uh, on, on this type of chart, uh, you probably ought to be implementing drought strategy sometime in the, if that is the case there in May. At 20%, it should already be in effect if it's a negative 20. If you like this chart, you know, there up on the left, we can certainly be able to supply it to you just to look at what your ranch precipitation looks like against the long term for your region. The next part would just be maintain a, a measure of flexibility. You know, within the stocking rate, you know, we can look at if we're conservatively stocked, if we're about 10% below uh, what we consider an average year, we'd only be stocked one in three to four years in this part of the country. If you're 20% below, it may be seven to eight years. You, you know, you lend yourself the opportunity to get through a whole lot easier if we are conservatively stocked. And as you move more to the arid west, that number may be on your, your long-term uh, uh, fixed stocking rate, may be considerably less than that. But you, what you'd like to be able to do is be able to cover yourself adequately 80% of the years and then you just have to, to adjust your stocking rate accordingly. And in the good years, provide yourself opportunities for uh, capturing some of the resources that might be made available. In, in, uh, in short, conserv a conservative stocking rate provides for flexibility opportunities and additional risk, risk management. As Frank had said, you know, the more he can uh, store up and grow through the growing season, he mitigates that risk when the drought actually occurs. Just as an example, a conservative stocking rate provides for opportunity to retain ownership of his calf of a, of a calf crop. You know, it may be all or a part, depending on the, the conditions. You may be able to carry a portion of your calf crop into uh, uh, later in the season. In this part of the world, typically, what we see is that if you're able to do that, you can actually increase income off of one calf crop uh, over the, what you would have had if you just had cows themselves. So it's a unique opportunity to not only manage your land resources, it also mitigates the risk of drought. Next part point we wanted to look at in preemptive drought management is the pasture management itself. You know, plan to do the right things well. You, you know, Frank's got a plan. I'm sure Scott's going to talk about his plan here in a minute. But what we've got to do is do the right things well, starting with the pastures. You know, have a pasture management plan. Identify the key things that you need to do in order to manage the grazing resource first and then overlay your livestock needs second. That's the uh, where a lot of producers probably fail to, to, to achieve is they're always trying to make their stocking rate or their pasture plan fit their livestock production. It should be just opposite. We need to be managing our livestock to fit the grazing resource, always trying to build up our pasture systems. If you have introduced pastures as you get far further into the eastern United States, you need to manage your fertility. You know, be able to take the soil samples and actively manage those pastures that are contributing most to your stocking rates. And pay particular attention to the phosphorus and potassium. These are the nutrients that supply uh, uh, the health to the entire plant system, the root structure, the benefit uh, the roots themselves. So if we're not taking care of the roots below the ground, there's no way that we can be able to take care, proper care of the plants above ground. In our native rain systems, we need to be trying to extend our grazing season. We want to make sure that we have growing season deferment of our native pastures at some point in time. Managing our rest and recovery periods are critical, especially with these native systems if we expect to build resiliency in preparation for drought. Next point on pasture management is to implement our soil health principles. We know what they are. We've heard them uh, over the years, but are we actually managing and applying those to our pasture systems? E.J. Dykster House, and back in the 50s, he's one of the fathers of, soil, uh, of, soil, of range management. He made a statement, a man whose pastures are short needs the rain the most. A man whose pastures are in good shape makes the most of the rain he gets. Just as Frank was saying, even a small amount of rain, when you've got good conditioned pastures, can absorb water and provide growth that pastures that are not in good shape can't do it. This is not only critical when you're during what I'd call favorable conditions, it's extremely apparent when, it, when you're coming out of a drought. If you've managed your residuals properly, what occurs is that you'll have little or no lack of recovery and we may begin to rebuild the carrying capacities that we've lost following drought, uh, some of the droughts in the past. Just in the 2011 to 2012 drought, the individuals that I know that actively managed their pastures, reduced their stocking rate, and implemented drought plans early, 
once the once the drought was over, they actually saw a benefit, an increase in their preferred desirable tall grasses that they're actually trying to manage for. It's pretty exciting to see some of the recovery that can occur if your pastures are in good shape. So we've really got to be managing our residuals, following what we what we know are recommended harvest efficiencies at all times, regardless of whether we're in drought or in favorable conditions. We've got to keep in mind it takes grass to grow grass. We need that grass there so when the moisture occurs, we can have the regrowth that's necessary in order to sustain our uh, land and our, and our systems. Just quickly, the soil health principle, just keeping the ground covered. Preventing the erosion, reducing evaporation, improving rain infiltration, insulating the surface, you know, the things that we know that are going to build the organic matter within the soil, which is the water holding capacity to a large degree in most soils, is what we need to be focused for. And keeping the ground covers contributes to that. We, we need to minimize disturbance as much as possible. But in our grazing systems, we're going to have some sort of disturbance. At least we're going to be grazing across these properties hopefully in an intentional managed focus, but we also may need fire in our native rangeland systems in some locations, as well as periodic brushing and, and pasture control. So optimized disturbance may be a more accurate term or a phrase when we begin, begin to apply it to our grazing systems and as it applies to soil health. Uh, with three, we need to increase diversity. In native country, it ought to be relatively easy, but we need to make sure that we're getting the right type of forages uh, uh, throughout the seasons. As Frank pointed out, sometimes the cool season grasses are just as important as the warm season grasses, depending on the season. Depending on our management, we can we, we can manipulate it, but we've got to be paying attention. And the introduced systems is a little more difficult because we typically uh, operate those in monocultures, but introductions of other forages into these, these systems can actually build our soil health. Uh, keeping living roots in the, in the soil you know, prim primarily means we need to be managing our perennials and, and managing them properly. If we're using annuals, they can add uh, to our systems and we need to make sure that we're doing and managing those appropriately uh, that will be in complement to our perennial systems. Five, integrate grazing livestock. And following what, as Frank communicated, a planned, maybe adult, an adaptive multi-pasture or paddock system where you as a, as a manager have influence over timing, frequency, intensity, and duration of grazing. Timing, making sure that we're grazing at the right time and not before. Being sure that we have the right intensity during the times, the periods of time when the cattle are in the pastures, making sure that we're managing for adequate residuals and the frequency, not coming back too soon, too frequently, and then looking at the duration. How long do we need to be in there and all that? Uh, depends on the different factors we're actually managing. But we as producers can be intentional about our grazing and have the positive outcomes. And then three, just monitoring overall conditions. Regionally and nationally, using tools like the drought monitor, knowing what's going around uh, around the country and what's occurring near you. Using the tool like uh, the, you know, this uh, uh, water your, your table to better understand what the rainfall patterns are on at your ranch over the long term and how does that reflect to the growing conditions or your expected production each season? And knowing what the, your critical assessment dates may need to be. When you get into drought conditions, set timelines in front of you so that you know relative to your growing conditions or expectations, how you need to manage or adjust stocking should drought conditions prevail. Three, as we move into this uh, look again at pre preemptive drought management, we got to focus on contingency planning, doing the things that are going to make a difference in the long term. One of the probably one of the easiest ju or most justifiable justifiable capital expenditures is your water and fence developments, so that you can more efficiently and effectively apply grazing management to your ranches. You know, making sure that you have adequate distribution where you need it, uh, adequate recharge rates and volumes for the periods of time that you know that the cattle will be in in certain pastures. Uh, making sure that you have proper fence developments to where you can carry cattle where you want them at the time when you want them so that you can manage the rest and recovery, your grace periods, and managing the different rain sites, soil types, the, uh, uh, the terrain that uh, your ranch uh, uh, actually has. You know, you've, we've got to be adaptive. We've got to be sure that we are managing the entire resource as effectively as we can and sometimes putting in these permanent 
electric or temporary type fences will allow us to do that more effectively. And then hay storage, especially as you go east where you have higher rainfall, just be able to protect the, uh, the, 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 the hay from, from weathering or, or other losses, probably another one of those expenses that you can uh, justify relatively easy if you get enough rainfall and if you're an introduced pasture system where you can warn itself. But no regard, but in no regards am I, am, am I saying that you should ever try to feed through a drought. You know, typically, uh, uh, in every case I've ever seen, it's never going to pay for itself and it would never be justifiable. So just a warning, never attempt to feed through a drought. That's not the purpose of this, the, you know, at this point. And also develop uh, relationships regionally and nationally. You know, especially if you're considering relocating cattle, it's those relationships that you can build with people that you can trust where you may have an opportunity to move cattle to an area that may not be as droughty as you may be at a given time. But you got to have a relationship with these individuals in order in, in order to uh, make those connections oftentimes. And then we get into the drought plan. The key thing that we want to talk about on the drought drought plan is the implementation of it. Even though we have, de have developed it as a contingency plan, uh, well ahead of time, what does it look like as we get into it? And that's where we're going to focus now. Because even in a drought plan, we've still got to continue to proactively manage both the stock and rate in the pastures. And that's one of the key points that, that, I, uh, that we need to make. You never throw open all the gates. You've got to continue to manage uh, throughout the drought. Uh, just as a drought plan, some of, the, uh, some of the points that you need to be able to do is inventory your livestock and your forage reserves. You know, with a table something like this, you can monitor your reserve herd, herd days that are ahead of you against the livestock demand. How long is it going to take you to get to the next spring? And do you have too many cattle? Do you have enough forage re reserves at any given time? Or you expect to accrue between now and the next spring? That's what you're trying to manage for, and you need to be managed proactively for that. Inventory livestock water. You want to make use of forage uh, of the pastures that uh, uh, typically were have lack of water during drought conditions. You know, if they're going to be going out, if they're going to run out of water before you can use it, typically you want to make sure that you graze those first. Being able to identify those areas and uh, early on and inventory what capacity of water can you uh, adequately meet should you get into a drought. And then set critical assessment dates. Always be able to monitor, knowing where you're at so that you make uh, stocking or destocking decisions at different times. Prioritize your management such as weed control, fertilizer rates, uh, securing forage reserves early if you're going to be doing that. And you want to make sure that you do that well ahead of drought, typically during times when you have when you have cheaper prices on your forage reserves and uh, uh, at a time when they're they're most abundant. Seven, we get into the active part of the drought plan. Combine herds, subdivide pastures, grace pastures with limited water first. You know, we really want to get down to one herd, just as Frank described. Get down to one herd, subdivide those pastures. The drier it gets, we need to have more control at, at any given time, and have these daily allocations so that we can more efficiently graze the resources in the extreme case where you can actually go in, allocate the amount so that you can still manage the res residue heights and the reserve that you want to have going uh, as you move from one pasture to the next. Very efficient way of doing it. It does take some time and effort. And then continue investigating alternative grazing sources in the nearest unaffected area. You know where that might be should you consider relocating some of the some of your livestock. Investigate the livestock markets and price cycles and trends. In this drought of 2011 to 2012, just the early diagnosis of drought save producers lots of money. They destocked in the spring when at the early onset of that uh, uh, drought and maintained prices for cattle that uh, were never achieved again until we got into 2013, 2014 time period. So being able to market cattle successfully, knowing what those price cycles look like and trends and strategically market cattle make a lot of sense. And then continue to monitor your moisture, your moisture conditions, forgery, growth, and recovery. You know, as Frank said, if you can identify your pastures and know the key forages that are out there and, uh, and understand what that looks like and how you need to adjust your, your grazing, that's probably a much better method than trying to use a, a chart like, like we have right here. But as you get into uh, more predictable rainfall patterns, as you find in the central part of the U.S. and the east, uh, some tool like this could be effective. 
11 early wing calves. We can at least we, we can reduce our, our forage demand by, tw by almost 20% by early weaning our calves. Uh, so that's uh, an always a consideration. And then strategically marketing the cattle. Just as fr Frank diagnosed, you know, you, we want to wean these calves that are, you know, the we, uh, market our wean calves, our open replacement uh, heifers, open cows, anything that is year, uh, maybe months or years away from, from actually producing. These are the most expendable and you're still maintaining the factory with on the operation. And then you begin to look at your cows, you know, first getting rid of the cows that that, uh, that have issues, the bad udders and, and uh, non-uniform, poor doers, older cows. You try to get down to the point where you have the core of your herd still left to take place. And then if it begins to become even more drastic, then begin to look at your bred heifers and mature cows. So as we begin to get, get, get toward the end of this right here, you know, this would be just an example of a destocking protocol where it's where you're looking at the impact of destocking would have against your forage demand and your expected forage uh, uh, production could be uh, as you're beginning to manage both of those, where you've got a target about how much you think you need to be destocked based on your experiences and or indications that you have used through your monitoring, then begin to uh, look at the animals that are, are uh, uh, younger animals or, or open animals, and then begin to get to the point where you see how many groups of animals or how many animals within these different classes that you need to destock in order to meet your destocking target. And, you know, thirdly, this would be the area that you'd be looking at next, as we, we talked about earlier. So just having a destocking protocol that where you systematically understand how you want to step through uh, uh, reducing your stocking rate and still maintain the factory into the future. So in summary, you know, managing drought, uh, we've got two time periods that we've got to be focused on. The area that uh, what we call the drought itself, <coughs> and the time period before the next drought. We've got to constantly be managing some of the, the key uh, areas that we have the most influence over. As a result, we look at uh, drought mitigation as being, being a preemptive management uh, plan or part of our preemptive management plan. So therefore, stocking rate in pastures and developing contingency plans are critically important, no matter whether you're in a drought or you're preparing for the next drought. And when you're in a drought, we want to be sure that that uh, we have a drought plan already in place and that we're walking through this the way we should. And then remember, continue to proactively manage stocking rate and pastures throughout. Because as we come out of the drought, we wanna make sure that our lands are prepared to take that first rain and recover rapidly. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to uh, Scott with Yolo Ranch. Uh, Scott Stone is uh, a rancher there in California and, uh, interested in see what he has to say as he manages uh, drought himself. Scott? Thank you, Hugo. Uh, so our company is Yolo Land and Cattle Company. We're based in Woodland, California. My brother Casey and I operate a cow calf and stalker operation. We also farm hay on our ranches, which are located on the west side of the Sacramento Valley. My father Henry started the ranch back in 1976. This is our 44th year in the business. Um, this is one of my favorite pictures of my lovely wife, Karen. And what I like so much about this picture, is not only is she in it, but it's also so the last time it was raining out in our country. So our home ranch consists of 7,500 acres that run from about 300 foot elevation on the valley floor up to about 2,300 foot elevation at the top of the mountains. We have all our cattle in the mountain ranches from the end of October until the middle to the end of May. In May, we gather and ship all our cattle off our hill ranches and ship them down to irrigated pasture ranches about 30 mi miles from our hill ranches. In our part of California, during the summer months, the annual and perennial grasses are not nutritional enough to provide good feed for the spring pears year round, so we have to ship everything to irrigated pastures for the summer and the fall. In our part of the state, the normal average rainfall is between 18 and 22 inches. And the one thing you can consistently say about our state is that there is no more normal and every year is a different adventure. Fires, floods, earthquakes, we have it all out here. In 2018, we had two different fires that burned a total of 7,000 acres of our 7,500 acre home ranch. 
uh, the fall rains historical used to start around the middle of October. It would rain a few inches and then the winter grasses would start. And then it would start turning cold in November, maybe the beginning of December. 2018, after the fire on the ranch, we got the very first rain November 30th of that year. Then the weather turned very cold about a week after. So the grass did not start growing until the middle of February in 2019, which is also the time we stopped feeding hay to our cattle, the latest we ever fed. That winter, we received 36 and a half inches of rain and we had a lot of flooding and erosion due to the lack of vegetation to hold the water back in the hills during the big storm events. And uh, this slide I'm showing you and the next one I'm gonna show you are some of our pond, bigger ponds on the ranch. This is what they look like at this time of year. So now we're knocking on spring's door the last week of March of this year, and we've had a whopping 10 and a half inches of rain. In the last 11 weeks, We've had only a half inch of rain. So here we are again going down from one extreme to the other. The interesting thing about trying to prepare for drought out here is that we usually are trying to recover from something else prior to dealing with the drought. Thank God we cattlemen are ex ex extreme optimists. So today I'd like to discuss what some of the strategies that we've been using to try and deal with drought as we settle into another one out here in California. I do not have a lot of scientific charts and graphs to detail how we've dealt with droughts, just some pictures and a little common sense. Every livestock operation in every state is completely different, and you just have to try and manage your own resources that you have at hand on your operation to deal with droughts. Most of the things that we've been doing have been occurring over time, and have multiple goals when we tackle them. Managing for drought is always part of these decisions and goals. Well, so some of these droughts start going through the strategies. Over the last 13 years, we've been switching our herd from 100% fall calving herd to 100% spring calving herd. And last summer, we took the final step of selling off all our older bred fall cows. We did keep 50 of the youngest and best fall cows and held them over to breed this spring with all our other spring cows. And we did this for the following reasons. Uh, first of all, we do not need to feed spring cows any hay like we used to do to the fall cows. This frees up labor and resources to do other things, saves us money, uh, and now we sell the hay, which increases that revenue stream. It's much nicer to calve out the cows, brand the calves in the spring, rather than November or December, when it is usually rainy. The cows are calving in sync with nature, not against it. After we wean the calves in the fall, and we wish to retain them as stalkers, they are ready to go out in the hills for the winter. We already own them, we have all our cost into them, and they are locally raised. Another thing we try to do on all our owned and leased ranches is rotationally uh, graze the, ran the ranches and it looks there's different systems for different ranches depending on size, water availability, and everything else. In order to graze cattle in a successful rotational system, the most important thing is to have good water infrastructure and good fences. You can get by even if your fences are not in great shape, but you cannot get by without good water resources. Ideally, we like to see two sources of drinking water in each field. One is the dirt tanks or stock ponds that we have multiples of in each field. The other is development of springs or domestic wells that are solar powered. A good well can provide water to cattle in more than one field. Three years ago, we partnered with our local NRCS office in Woodland to develop a water system that would provide water year round to some of the fields in the middle and south end of the ranch that were consistently short of water when the ponds would dry up in the spring. Uh, we were not able to take advantage of grazing some of these fields in the fall until we got winter rains to replenish water in the ponds. In a drought situation, uh, that is exacerbated uh, because we don't have the water for the ponds. So we drilled some test holes around the ranch with hopes of installing solar-powered domestic well and drilled a small domestic well at the south end of the ranch. We then installed uh, two 
5,400-gallon water storage tanks and connected them to a new domestic well and an existing natural spring on the ranch. Uh, in this picture, you'll see the windmill that's been out there on the ranch for probably 70 years and, and the tank next to it, and then uh, you'll see the new solar pump and well. Um, one storage tank that we put in is located at the bottom of the hill, and it has a surface solar pump, which pumps it up to the other storage tank, which is on the top of that hill to the right. You can just barely see the top of the storage tank. From the, and uh, here's the other picture of the tank on top of the hill, and that tank has a two-inch uh, PVC line that we installed that runs for two miles across the ranch. And we tied that line into three other storage tanks in different fields, which increased the storage capacity of the total system to about 26,000 gallons. The new system also provided us with water troughs at 14 different locations, and it has allowed us to utilize the lower fields in the fall with or without any rain. One of the critical points of the water system is the type of water troughs and flows that are used in the system. For any new construction on the ranch, from the water systems, we only install four by 10 concrete troughs. We also only install Watson floats, which have proven to be the most maintenance-free and reliable stock tank floats that we have ever used. During the drought, when we only have one water source in a field, we cannot afford to have the system get drained of the available water because of a faulty float or a leaking tank. Over the last few years, we have replaced almost all the metal and plastic troughs on the ranch with concrete troughs and Watson floats. It costs more to do it, but they rarely have any issues. We are constantly cleaning and repairing existing reservoirs on all the ranches so that when it does rain, we're in a position to maximize the capture of winter runoff. We are a proponent of composting on rangelands, have been trying to do so for the last few years. When possible, we make our own compost on the ranch with old hay or source some shavings or horse manure on close by horse ranches. We have partnered up with our local resource conservation district and the California Department of Food and Agriculture for a three-year demonstration grant for the statewide Healthy Soils Program. The demonstration grant provides funding for an application of five tons of compost applied to 50 acres of rangeland each year for three years. The soil is then closely monitored and measured for the amount of carbon from the air, the plants and roots sequester, also the amount of additional plant growth produced, and the amount of additional water infiltration capacity, i.e. groundwater recharge, that the soils can achieve due to the compost applications. The scientific studies being generated by these programs are proving what we ranchers have known all along. Grazing on ranch, rangelands is good for the environment. So we're fortunate enough to have some improved irrigated pastures down in the valley about 30 miles from the ranches. And on these irrigated pastures, over the last few years, we installed a concrete weir and sump pump to reuse the drain water that's generated from the flood, irriga flood irrigation of 600 acres of the pastures. Once the water is applied to the irrigated pastures, it is captured in the system and reused over and over again to re-irrigate the pastures. We've also installed a 24-inch drain pipe under a county road to bring drain water from an existing reclamation district drainage ditch into our return water system. This provides us with additionally economically priced irrigation water for the pastures. Thanks for your time this evening. I will be happy to answer questions at the end of the program. Well, thank you to all of our presenters, uh, Frank, Hugh, and Scott. Um, NCBA's Cattlemen's webinar series has the goal of bringing you the latest information that's relevant to any producer in this country, and our presenters tonight have sure helped us to achieve that goal. 
As we move into the question and answer session, I want to remind everybody that while our spring legislative conference was canceled in Washington, D.C., the Washington, D.C. team continues to work on your behalf with regulatory agencies, including lobbying for supportive programs like EQIP, which help cost share many of the management practices discussed in this series. Your officers, NCBA officers, uh, and the leadership in Denver and Washington, D.C. are continually engaged on a daily basis uh, to address these challenges that we now face with this COVID-19 invasion. Uh, so be assured that, that we're working as hard as we possibly can to make sure that we can optimize benefits even in this troubled time. Uh, if you're a member of NCBA, really appreciate your, as a treasurer of NCBA, I really appreciate your support. Uh, and I know that uh, your fellow members appreciate that too. If not, please consider joining and you can do that by going to ncba.org. Uh, two more webinars are coming up. One this Thursday night with two professional counselors who will discuss how to manage stress and how we can support each other during these trying times. The final webinar will, is entitled Optimizing Your Operation Legumes, Crop Residues, and Cover Crops. Uh, and registration for both of those webinars is open under the producer tab at ncba.org. I was interested that both, that two of the presenters mentioned uh Hugh and and Frank mentioned animal management and, and I think it was Hugh who called it preemptive management uh, as as one of the tools we use to mitigate the uh the problems with drought I'll just give you a quick uh a quick anecdote uh the ranch I'm associated with has uh several thousand mother cows but we also run 6,000, up to 6,000 uh, range sheep when we have the ability to do so. Normally, we wouldn't be coming out of a winter range and hauling the, the ewes back to the headquarters ranch for, for lambing in, until about uh, the middle of April. And two weeks ago, we made the decision because of forage, uh, lack of forage, to haul uh, 5,000 of those ewes, we left 1,000 replacement uh, ewes on the range, but we hauled the rest of them back. So we had to, we had to move off that range uh, about four weeks early. Uh, with that, uh, let's get to some questions. Josh, I think you've got, uh, got those that have been delivered uh, via email, and I'll turn it over to you. Sure, and just to remind everyone that's still on, you can chat in questions in the question box on your screen. Just click on that and type in any questions you have. I'll start with one, I think probably geared toward you, but everybody may uh, be able to chime in based on your experience. Uh, how do you go about um, assessing long-term rainfall data if you haven't collected it yourself? Do you know of any sources, Hugh, that folks could go to? or or any of the panelists, any recommendations on how to get that data from years gone by? Well, it, it, it's, it is difficult. That's one of the challenges that, that we all face. You know, in some states like Oklahoma, where you've got a mesonet system, you've got a long-term rainfall uh, uh, records that go back uh, a number of years. And you, and you don't have to have 125 years worth of rainfall data, but, if, but when you develop like a water year table, you just need to go back the last, uh, you know, 20, 25 years. Your county that you reside in maintains monthly rainfall records. And that's where I found the most reliable source to get that, at least for individual ranchers that I work with. Those charts. Any others? I, yeah, I was just going to say those charts that, that, I, that I've showed you, most of those will come from 
uh, the southern uh, southern climatic. The, 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 I'm trying to remember what the abbreviation, but the southern uh, climate uh, SCIPPS is what is the is the abbreviation. But the southern climate hub is where a lot of that information would, would be coming out of. And if you have questions, contact me there at Noble. I, I don't mind trying to help. Frank or Scott, either one of you uh, look to any outside sources for any of that historical data, or you rely on your own data? I rely on my own. Um, I started for whatever reason in '84 and, and keep pretty detailed records. And uh, <clears throat> I've always tried to establish trends with that rainfall, and, and uh, I can't find one. So anyway, that, that's that's what I work with. Um, yeah, we we use kind of the old-fashioned way. We we, we have. Uh, rain gauges and we just write down from every storm and we tabulate it at the end of the season and then store it away and compare it against the previous years. We're probably doing that a little over 20 years. Hugh, I think I've got a follow-up question to that. Um, I think folks were maybe having a little bit of trouble understanding. I know you were flying through that information, but understanding your uh, some of your tables and how you um assess the reduced rate you know um what what those triggers are i can hand the controls back to you if you want to go back to that um that what that uh, rainfall table tell you let me pull it back up just tell me when you're ready and i'm happy to kick it back over to you and it seems like that's what um A whole lot of the questions are being generated around. Okay, shift it yep. back. And to I'm gonna now. I'm gonna make a suggestion. We have another question about uh, supplementation strategies on deferred pastures, and I just want to refer you back to the webinar we did. Uh, I believe it was the one last week where Jason Sawyer from King Ranch Institute spoke, and he spoke extensively on supplementation. That was a big focus of his presentation. Um, so you might check that out, and if you have a uh, follow-up question, feel free to email me, jwhite at beef.org, and I can get that question to Jason or, or some of the folks at Noble uh, if you want to get a little more specific on that. Um, Hugh, I'm going to hand it to you if you're ready. I'm ready. Go ahead. Okay. All right. Are you, are you seeing the water at your table there, Josh? Yeah, it's up. Okay. Uh, in, in particular, if you look over here on this left side, can you see my arrow being moved? Yes. Okay. That percent annual production, where where this thirty percent, sixty five percent, ninety percent, you know, your NRC, NRCS, local NRCS, can give you an idea of about what annual production uh, uh, curves would look like for any general area, and and far, you know, here in the Southern Great Plains. And, and really, as you go to the, up through the northern Great Plains, by the time we get to the uh, end of May, we expect about 30% of annual production. That may be 25 in some areas. It may be a little more than that as you get further south. And then 65% about the 1st of June and 90% by, at the end, by the end of uh, August. So we've got some parameters to where we typically know that, that there's a certain amount of production. It's going to start slow in the spring, and then it's going to uh, really uh, uh, take off while, as we get to that early part of the summer. And then when the rain begins to slow down, at least in our part of the country, we usually see a slump in July and August. Uh, and at that point, most of the, the moisture that we're going to have accrued uh, to grow most of our forage is going to already occur. So that's where I'm looking at those, those critical dates. Knowing that, that I've got about 30% at the end of May, end of May is easy to remember. I'm looking at about what I need uh, to, to, to trigger that. And if I look down over here where I've got this, uh, about 60 percent, 55 to 60 percent of the long-term average. These numbers here are just the long-term average compared to what is the uh, the annual average, based off of each each one of these months. So you, here's the cumulative. Here's the uh, long-term average. So as you go down through here, you've got some trigger points. And then as I pointed over to this variance, 
when you're going through and you're and with this table if uh, if you wanted it I could provide it to you all you have to enter is this white column the rest of it's already pre-calculated for you so you'd have your long-term average uh, conditions then you get into your actual the you know the records that that both Scott and Frank were, were talking about plug that in for the for the growing season that, that that's uh, uh, occurring going back to the beginning of the October of the year before and just see where you're at and there's here where I look at the triggers when I get down to March if I'm in a negative number or uh, close to zero I'm paying really close attention to what that spring would be if I'm down like say uh, when we got into 2011 uh, that year when we got into May we had producers calling me up here uh, by the time we got to first of May and where we should be uh, about 47 uh, percent of the long-term average by that or I say 44 percent by the long-term average at that point in time we were down at 20 so we were 24 percentage points below where we should be at this point and that was the trigger point so you, you know I had producers say, I mean they're going to destock well I had uh, several of them destock completely and just said look I want to save my, 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 my land resource as opposed to uh, sacrificing or trying to to manage the drought. I had others that had pretty large operations that were pretty proud of the, the cattle. They destocked by 20%. That was their trigger. Is they if they were 20% here, they destocked by 20% and then reassessed it. And then when they got down into the end into May and they saw that the long-term forecast was that for that drought to continue through 2011, maybe into 20, 2012, they destocked another 10%. So this was the trigger off this variance that that indicated how much they wanted to reduce their stocking rate initially. Did that, did that help explain that? Yeah, I think so. Um, and you're you're running your you could do this calendar whatever you know starting and stopping with whichever month made the most sense for your correct grazing season or production system, right? Right, you know, depending on where you're at, this 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 may look a little bit differently, uh, especially get over into California. Scott, you know, it may not make any sense at, at all for you, depending on when you typically expect your 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 rains and, and uh, the recharge to occur. But in this part of the country where we have this bimodal uh, rainfall, where we get uh, fall, I mean, rains in the spring and then another typically a uh, you know set of rains in the fall, this tends to be relatively accurate for us. But until you put it out and, and study it, it'd be uh, you, you know it can be easily adapted to fit your purposes. All right, I'm just catching up on the the questions here. Okay. Um, you can take it back if you need to. <laughs> yeah, I'll do that. Scott, you. Um, I have one on water resource development. You talked a lot about that. Everyone talked somewhat about that, but um, you know, explain. Um, I guess what have you guys always had the intention of having two water sources per uh, pasture or grazing unit, or is that a more recent decision based on coming through drought to develop those water resources, or what? You know, what's been kind of the impetus behind that? Well, yes, we, we've probably been concentrating on it more in the last 10 years, and we had those droughts in 2014 and 15 that was pretty substantial, and, and even the systems that we had put into place to try to supplement the, the, the supply weren't enough. So well, that's when we got together with NRCS and came up with some additional uh, methods to put this system in and, and trying to maximize what we could do. Um, which included, you know, drilling for new wells. But yeah, we it it it's a product of having to deal with those droughts and not having enough water and trying to figure out ways to have more water available throughout the ranches. And have you guys been pretty happy with the setting it up on solar? Has that worked well for you? And I guess how what's the longest running? system there that you've got had powered by solar uh, we started using solar 20 years ago and thank goodness that the technology has come a long way since that time and we have uh, a couple of 
systems where we had put in two different, the original system failed after about eight or nine years, and then we put in another system, and then when we went, uh, put in this two-inch line and, and connected all these different systems, so there was actually some places that we had solar pumps that they weren't coming from a well, they were lifting water out of some of the ponds and putting it into storage tanks. So we took those solar pumps out of the ponds and hooked it into the main system, which was much more reliable. Um, we're fortunate enough to have a really good spring on the, at one end of the ranch that's never gone dry. So that's always, that's kind of provided to be a good base built the system off of. And so we're looking for ways to uh, maximize that water source and spread it out to different sites on the ranch. Excellent. Frank, one for you. Um, you mentioned, um, you know, having good results, putting more cattle into, into one group and rotating um, maybe a little more frequently or just changing up your grazing rotation a bit. What, I guess, what's your experience with that? It, it, was that something that you worked into? Because I, I know you you mentioned that you might want to ease into that and not try that all at once. Maybe just go into a little more detail about your experience with that and, and what you've learned with that process. Okay, when my father was a continuous grazer, relatively light stocking rate, and uh, through ag teacher, uh, business uh, college courses and whatnot, uh, I recognize the benefits in, in uh, rest, and then uh, we started uh, from time to time resting a pasture. And then I had the opportunity to uh, attend uh, Alan Savory's San Parsons Grazing School. Uh, <clears throat> came out of that school, put in several cells, and uh, I wasn't real satisfied with them for a number of reasons. First, it wasn't kind of wasn't home. Uh, you might uh, put me back onto my sis screen and I'll, I'll uh, show a pasture situation we utilized there. But uh, we uh, got away from grading cells and went back to continuous uh, uh, utilizing the pastures that were available. Um, go down here. All right, this picture is a place that we lease. Uh, there's uh, 17 pastures in that ranch. Uh, originally, it was two ranches that were put together, thus the number of pastures we had. Uh, and uh, when we leased the place, we looked at it, we considered splitting it into two different grazing units. Uh, we were in the middle of a 2011 drought and we elected to go to a single herd program within that 17 pastures. And just any ranch I've ever taken on or looked at or anything, even if it's just got four pastures, you can figure a planned grazing program within that ranch without doing the ex going to the expense of building a lot of fences. Now you can look at this topo map and we've got considerable elevation change, uh, brush, issues and whatnot and it's really hard to build temporary fences in this country so we utilize old pastures now we're talking about water a while ago when you've got uh, a ranch like the one we're looking at here and which was uh, traditional continuous grazing each pasture had water systems that were designed for the number of livestock that would be in that pasture year round when you go to a single herd, suddenly you put a lot of demand on a single pasture. Granted, it's for a short period of time, but you've got to have a lot of water there. So uh, once again, uh, as Scott, through NRCS and an EQIP program, we were able to do some pretty extensive water development on this ranch and gave us the ability to have that single herd program. Well, without that water development, uh, we could not have done it. Great information. Thanks for sharing that. Um, that's all the questions I have coming in from the uh, viewers on the webinar. Joe, do you have any, or do any of you as presenters have any questions for each other? Happy to open that up before we close things out tonight. 
I tell you, I've got I've got a question for 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 both uh, Scott and Frank. But as as you look at moving into more of a, uh, intentionally managing your operations, what was the biggest challenges that you had to overcome? Granted, one of them is water, but what was the biggest challenges that you've had to overcome? And what were the successes that told you early on that you were on the right track? I'll jump in, Mr. Frank. Um, once again, I went through that <clears throat> grazing school. I came out just plumb full of them and vinegar and, and uh, went into too many grazing cells. They, it got too complex for me. I was disappointed in livestock performance. And uh, that's when I went to working my back way back to traditional pastures, probably because uh, I liked uh, battling up riding through that traditional pasture versus uh, riding through electric fencing in the wagon wheel. And that, that's not a very, uh, I don't know if that was a financial decision or not, but it's a lifestyle decision. But as we developed into that process of using traditional pastures, uh, have become very comfortable with it. And, and when I see things like that big blue stem that I highlighted so much and the, the Texas cup grass and the density of grasses, uh, I get just plumb beside myself. It, it's seeing us improve. And when we reached the point that we did not feed a deer cattle, and when I say don't feed, there's no hay, no tubs, no blocks, uh, no cake, with exception of the uh, cooking cake to keep them gentle and whatnot. Uh, suddenly that operation uh, has become consistently profitable. Uh, you take that ranch that I was showing you there with those 17 pastures. If you had livestock in every pasture, there's 22 sections there. You would have one full-time man if you had livestock in every pasture. He would be a busy feller tending to the the water, the fences, the feeding of the livestock, and when we've gone to this single herd, that's reduced our labor needs. So uh, ultimately, profitability has is, uh, been the, the key factor in, in uh, what we do. And it's uh, really exciting what I see happen on a continuing basis. So I also through a ranching for profit school it was Stan Parsons back in 1995. And when you come home from one of those fields, you are all fired up uh, to start doing all these different things. But the problem is, is when then you have fi family dynamics and you come back from one of those seminars, you're speaking Russian and the rest of the family speaking Chinese. So. <laughs> The challenges are the family dynamics of, of getting everybody to get onto the same page and start moving in that direction. Uh, when I came back from that, those seminars uh, with my dad, who was a tremendous cattleman, um, he would have 30 to 50 head in each of the different pastures throughout the ranch. And that's where they would stay for the whole fall and winter season and spring. And so they were all fall cows and we would feed them uh, after we brought them back from the irrigated pasture. So you're going to a multitude of different pastures to feed your cattle. So the amount of hay that we fed, the labor that was involved, all those things, um, you know, they, they, they take a toll on your bottom line. And so slowly we started working together <clears throat> to try to implement some changes and figure out ways to change the cost liability of some of the ways of doing things. And uh, it's much easier to move some cattle as it, and you still get to look at them pretty darn well if you're, when you're moving uh, rotationally on a regular basis. And uh, so I've seen, I've seen the pastures are in better condition. Uh, they, they hold up better. They come back better from doing the rotational grazing with larger groups of cattle. Um, and the cattle get trained, they're e easier to move and, and you get, we go to the gates and, and whistle. And sure, we have to go after some with the horse, horses but, or the Hondas, but for the most part, it's uh, they're, they're kind of trained to move themselves because they know they're going to fresh feed. So we've had some, some good successes 
but early on there was family dynamic cha challenges and, and uh, we've got all that past this. Okay, thank you. Well, I, I will all right. add that. Yeah, go ahead. Um, I know some mob grazers that are extremely successful in what they do. I mean, it's amazing the livestock performance and, and the, uh, uh, the land change uh, for the better. And uh, I honor them for what they do. Um, I'm not structured mentally to go to that intensity level. That is one of the things with uh, the studies with savory and parsons, I had to admit to myself that uh, that was not the route I wanted to go. And so I kind of backed off to what fit my lifestyle and my comfort zone and, and uh, was fortunate to create something that's been very productive for us. And you're still seeing the results. I mean, that's that's the key. It, it's, it's uh, I agree. I think they're, they're, they're are multiple ways to skin the cat, so to speak. You know, you can still manage for those improvements, but it's in, it's through intentional management, monitoring, and making sure that the 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 results that you're achieving are fitting your goals, and, and ultimately yours are. So, moving to a higher intensity of grazing is isn't going to uh, help you achieve the goals that you want want to achieve when you're already making that type of progress today. So. Uh, you know, I think to your point earlier, it's got to fit you. You got to fit your lifestyle, and and uh, it main thing is it's, it's a continual management of those resources. Very true. All right. Well, thank you guys. Uh, we're going to wrap things up. Thank you all for joining tonight. Thank you, Joe, for hosting. And uh, you're very welcome. It's my pleasure. Everyone, take good. Take good care of yourself, stay healthy out there, and we'll look forward to uh, seeing many of you on future webinars. All right. Thanks, Thank you all. Yep. Thank you. Bye now. Enjoy. Bye. Bye.